All right, so what I'd like to do in this last 10 minutes is take a look at some examples of sources and sinks in actual real life resonance structures. So what you're looking at here in this top example is the enolate of acetaldehyde, which we're going to hit one more time before the end of this section. And basically, what we're looking for here are the high energy reactive electrons as the source and the low energy empty orbitals as the sinks. So take a look at this. Take a few uh, seconds, maybe 20 or 30 seconds. See if you can identify the electron source. And let's start with this structure on the right here. So see if you can identify a high energy electron source. And uh, just hit me up with the name of the orbital in the chat box. So if you think it's a sigma orbital, just type sigma, pi, or n. Remember, these are our filled electrons, our filled molecular orbitals. So which of those three do you think would be the most reactive, and where would it be located? I see one vote for pi, so the pi orbital here would be this guy here, and that's a good thought, but there's still there's one orbital that's a little bit more reactive than the pi. The, sec the pi is the second highest orbital here. So remember, keep in mind that the n non-bonding electrons are going to be your highest energy electrons. So in this case, the N would serve as the electron source. And one of the conventions, actually, that you'll see a lot of um, undergraduate teachers use is to circle the electron source. So in drawing the inner conversion of the resonance structures, people often will circle the pair of electrons that they're moving and then draw a curved arrow. Remember that represents the flow of two electrons like so from that circled deal there. And now since we're kicking down those electrons we have to kick off this pi bond and that clues us in that it's the pi star orbital of the pi bond that's actually acting as the um, electron sink here. Now notice that, and that gets us from the resonance structure on the right to the resonance structure on the left. To go in the reverse direction, it's the same source and sink, just located on different atoms. And this is pretty typical. You'll see the same kind of source and sink in both resonance structures, but the curved arrows will differ, differ a little bit, and the atoms on which the orbitals are located will differ. So here we have an N localized on carbon now, donating N and breaking the carbon-oxygen pi bond. So here it's the CO pi star is the sink, and it is the C lone pair, or the C non-bonding orbital, that's the source. All right, jumping down to this next example, here we see again, notice the similarity in structure. So here we have a lone pair, whoops, we have a lone pair next to a pi bond, there's our lone pair, there's our pi bond. Here again we have a lone pair next to a pi bond. And here again resonance is going to be important and it's going to be the exact same interaction. It's the N orbital on carbon, or the lone pair, as our source, donating N to the pi star of the double bond. Similarly here we have a pair of electrons corresponding to the N orbital, donates N to the pi star of the double bond, breaking it like so. And so we can see the inner conversion of these two resonance structures through those curved arrows. And remember, just as a subtle point, I've got a few, few extra minutes here, kind of ahead of schedule, so remember that the lone pairs, or excuse me, the curved arrows represent orbital interactions. So when we draw the arrow from the lone pair into this new bond and we break the pi bond, that arrow actually represents an N to pi star interaction. So you may see this notation. The N orbital is our source, the pi star is our sink, and that curved arrow actually represents that interaction within the actual molecular orbitals. Finally, a little bit more complicated example here. Notice we have a source in the nitrogen lone pair, and we have a sink over here in the empty 2p orbital on the carbocation, but they're far from each other. However, remember I said that the pi bond 
because it's both a source and a sink, can act as sort of a resonance relay. And the way that works here is the source will donate into the pi bond, and the pi bond will donate into the sink that it's next to. So this, you know, this kind of resonance interaction can occur over any number of pi bonds. So here's an example where we're using two pi bonds now, and we just donate into each pi bond in succession to generate resonance structures. So we can see how going from the source, breaking the pi bond, and donating the pi bond into the very final sink, which is the carbocation, leads to this resonance structure here on the right. Likewise, going in the reverse direction now, we see that the positively charged nitrogen can serve as a great sink. You can think of there being an empty atomic orbital on that nitrogen derived from the positive charge. And we can think of an electron source as this pi bond here. And once again, the pi bond between the carbon and nitrogen can serve as sort of a relay. So th those arrows right there will lead us back to the original resonance structure. And they represent the interaction of this pi bond with actually the pi star orbital of the carbon-nitrogen double bond. All right, so this kind of rounds out chapter one. And in the last couple of minutes here, I just wanted to say a few words about chapter one, kind of summarize what we've learned so far. So we started out talking about the conventions of drawing that organic chemists have used, and we learned how to construct Lewis structures and sort of interpret Lewis structures in terms of formal charge. So we would expect, for example, based on the fact that this carbon is negative, these electrons to be quite reactive. And we talked about how chemists have used Lewis structures to reason about reactivity, and then we transitioned into talking about atomic and molecular orbitals, which is really at the frontier of molecular structure today even. So chemists think about molecules in terms of their molecular orbitals, which are regions where electrons reside in space around molecules. And by building up molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals using the LCAO method, we can take these very generalizable, very common uh, atomic, simple atomic, and hybrid atomic orbitals and build up the molecular orbitals of very complicated molecules. But, and, and even though there's often a correspondence between what we draw in Lewis structures and the molecular orbitals, so for instance, we would expect this lone pair here on the carbonyl to be in a non-bonding uh, molecular orbital, and that would turn out to be the case. It's just simply in an sp2 hybrid atomic orbital. That doesn't always tell the whole story. So for instance here, even though we might expect this guy to be in a sp3 hybridized atomic orbital, in fact it's not. In fact it interacts with the pi bond, and that's where we saw the concept of resonance come into play. So Lewis structures don't always tell the whole story, and that's why we really need molecular orbital theory to fully describe molecules. So we rounded out our discussion of resonance with some examples, and you'll see resonance come back again and again as we talk about reactivity. But what we're going to talk about next time is how to think about molecules in three dimensions more as objects and less as bunches of electrons that are moving around and going crazy. So thinking about molecules as three-dimensional objects really brings a lot of interesting issues uh, to the four. So we've already seen how these two Lewis structures are actually the same molecule. What I'll put to you now is that molecules that look very, very similar can actually be very different. So for instance, uh, if we take, whoops, for instance, if we take um, this molecule here where the bond on the wedge is coming out at us, that molecule and this molecule here, whoops, with one hydroxyl on a wedge and one on a dash, are substantially different. And we'll learn about why they're different and the consequences that has on, on reactivity in chapter two. But that's all I've got, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and uh, thanks for watching.